All Kindred Eve by Matt Dunn One Conversations in the Dark Little Lamb Yes, dear wolf, O companion mine, my darkest friend in all of time. Oh no, I hate your water speak. It is bad. First writ by tongue that tastes no flavor, a riot of colors that none wish to savor. Use box or howls. I like howls. Howls make sense. If wolf still has claws and drooling, his lamb shall pause her poetic mewling. Fine, I will stop. But what will we do if not chase? There is commotion that interests me. I see that motion. Shapes. Bodies. They make noise, too. Joyous melodies upon delirious tongues. Tis a festival in our honor, dear wolf. Celebrating the dance of light and dark. Storm and serene. Tooth and arrow. I want to hunt the festival. And chase it. Our role is to witness. Perchance to understand. Why these mortals worship us so. That sounds boring. How long will it take? Until it ends. What if the festival does not end? All things end, dear wolf. No water speaking. No chasing. Deal. Closer then we go together. O companion mine. His lamb. And her wolf. Two, the Pale Rider. Every year, those who did not keep faith with the Buru gathered for a night of exceptionally unfettered debauchery. All who call the ports and islands of Bilgewater home, including those mysterious Buru worshipping their spiral gods, should they ever choose to attend, were welcome. There was no planning committee. Yet the riotous jamboree never failed to occur on the final mo uh, wolf moon of the year. The revelers, of which there were too many to count, hailed from every culture and class. There were brigands and bankers, captains and cooks, fisher folk and freelancers. They donned macabre costumes and, by duskfall, packed the docks beyond capacity. It was common for more than a handful of attendees to fall into the waters and perish then and there. It was uncommon for someone to lend a helping hand. What happened this evening, though, was truly rare. Not a soul fell from the docks and perished. Some whispered the lack of early deaths was an ill omen. All ships were bound for the same destination, and for this night only. No captains charged passage. Once loaded with folks dangling from mast riggings or towed behind larger vessels on lifeboats, the ships set sail, dotting the eerily calm waters, gliding toward the craggy fang of an island called Witch Tree Rock. The outlandishly clad partygoers paired up and filled the beaches. Now that night had well and truly fallen, the crowds amassed to celebrate life's chaotic dance towards death and those who bring that death. The celebration of those eternal reapers was called Kindred Eve. It was easy to see someone's origins based on costumes. Folks of Shuriman stock resembled elegant tusked gazelles, partnered with speckled hyenas. Those tracing from lineages across the sea to fair Ionia often had no partner, choosing to represent a snake and a sparrow on their, on their body. There were other... Other odd interpretations, too. A jaw fish and a minnow. A bloodied antlered stag and a sleek rabbit. A rose and a stinging bee. By far the most prevalent representation drew from Wilder Valoran, who dressed as the oldest depiction of the kindred. A lamb paired with a wolf. But tonight was special. Amid the costume revelers were the kindred themselves, Lamb shone like the palest moon, while wolf floated like the darkest smoke. Their eyes were the same, haunting and cold. 
a shimmering ethereal blue. Had the kindred chosen any other night to reveal their forms, all would have run in terror. But on kindred eve, the reapers of life walked among a crowd of celebrating the balance of death, disguised with no disguise at all. The revelers gathered before a torch-lit path that twisted up toward the other end of which tree rock, passing through a single shop-lined concourse and ending atop a cliff from which sprouted a great leafless tree. Why do they wait? Wolf asked trying to keep his great tongue from licking his lips. They await an invitation, dear wolf, Lamb said, her eyes taking in the island and setting. A bent figure descended the path alone. When the man reached the beach, he stopped and climbed atop a large, flat rock in the surf. Waves gently lapped against its edges. He raised his hands and silence settled over the crowd. Even those who stood knee-deep in the water stopped kicking away the whisker eels and ankle sharks to grant the man their attention. The man spoke in a high-pitched voice that carried over the waters to those who still on the moored ships, waiting to wade for, uh, toward the beach. Once a long while ago, he said, there lived a pale rider who rode upon a great black beast. Every town shunned him, for they knew that if he rode through their village, any who met his gaze would not live out the night. I know this story, the great shadowy wolf said. His tongue lolled out enthusiastically. And so it happened one night that the pale rider came upon a fork in his path. One road led into a deep dark wood, and the other toward a city of light. Faced with a choice, and knowing it would take him twice as long to travel both paths, the storyteller pulled a prop axe from his cloak. Moonlight danced along its blade. The pale man took his axe, he said, kneeling down, and knelt before the ancient Eldlock tree that forked the road. Wolf cocked his head in confusion. Do I know this story? A tale, to a tale told throughout time is tainted by each tongue that tells it, the snowy lamb said. We know a truer story, of which this faint dramaturgy projects only shadow. The storyteller milked an overly theatrical pose. Thousands of kindred faces hung upon his every flourish. And cut himself? Right down the middle, the crowd replied in eerie unison. The storyteller pressed the axe blade into his brow and jerked his hand back, uh, backward, slashing his head open from front to back. Rather than sever flesh, however, he merely split a seam sewn into his cowl. Coils of tightly wound ribbon and snowy, snowy confetti showered from his head. A large paper lamb supported by thin bamboo struts popped up from the top of his hood. It was covered in cotton tufts and painted gleamingly light, white, with hooved legs and angular snout of a black wolf's mask. The paper lamb's hands held a great, a giant cutlass covered in arcane runes, in a masterful display of ambidextry. While the lamb popped out, the storyteller tore his shirt with his other hand. More wooden struts painted black and affixed to a corset spread the man's robes out like a uh, like the dark fur of a great lupine beast a cherubic lamb face painted on his be breast many miles the two paths met again and the pale rider regarded the other half of himself his two halves had grown so different despite being one together they drowned his axe in a river and decreed to forever walk side by side. So they would never be alone. Wolf's eyes were as full as he looked upon his little lamb. Lamb caressed the wolf mask that covered her true face. So they would never be alone. So they would never be alone, the crowd intoned, finishing the tale. With the parable's end, cheers rang out, mixed with laughter, and the sounds of flintlock pistols fired into the night sky. It was time to walk the path to 
toward the town. As the crowd marched past the slab of stone, the storyteller swooped and dipped toward his rowdy audience, and they applauded and dodged the lamb's paper sword. Tankards of dark ale and white wine were passed around. The storyteller did not notice his paper sword pass through Wolf's body as if it, it as if nothing was there. Little lamb, Wolf said to his favorite lamb, do you have a sword? Do not hide it from me. I want to see it. Lamb looked to her precious wolf. I keep no secrets from my dear wolf, not now and not ever. Torchlight flickered across the sea of kindred revelers as they danced, sauntered, or marched up the path to the town ahead. Pressed tightly together, each shove created a wave that traveled the crowd. Lamb and her wolf paid it no mind. Their movements were swift, for they danced upon heads and leapt from shoulder to shoulder. They breezed over the crowd like a zephyr over rolling seas. All kindred eve had begun. Three, kindred souls. Slaughtered lambs, hanging by their necks, their heads dyed black with squid ink, decorated storefronts. Every now and then, the innkeepers removed a carcass and placed it on a spit to be slathered and salted in honey and roasted over an open flame. Peddlers sold favors to the throngs walking the cobblestoned avenue. Quarrels erupted between the violent halves of kindred pairs. Wolves punched sharks, hyenas kicked stags. Wide circles formed around the fisticuffs, which ev eventually ignited into brawls. Teeth, blood, and wayward bits of costume littered the street. Lovers embraced openly, their lips pressing tightly onto the faces of their partners, or whoever had the luck of being in kissing distance. Perched atop a large cask, Lamb and Wolf watched the heavier gaggle, or the heaving gaggle of mortals eat dance and shove through the streets of which truck of which tree rock look they knock each other down they celebrate a crude approximate uh, approximation of a fate none escaped staving off a common fear though imitation and jest through imitation and jest through purging and release they see us not for what we are by the bearded lady your costume is almost the best i've seen tonight a female voice interrupted Lamb from uh, the din of celebrants. Lamb and Wolf looked down from their perch. A young couple peered up at them. Isn't that a wonderful cost uh, oh, outfit? The woman said to her companion. The man shrugged in reply. Her costume was made up of carefully placed cotton wads, artistically applied white paint. His was lesser effort. A black loincloth and white face paint applied in sloppy streaks. Your Faria costume is amazing. She reached up and stroked Lamb's shoulder. How did you make your fur feel so cold on this late summer's eve? The woman's gaze fell on Wolf. And your Wolio friends using enchantment it reminds me of a harrowing. You should enter the pageant. You'd take third place, at least. Lamb turned to Wolf. Wolf turned to Lamb. An ethereal blue light shone uh, behind both of their masks, cold and dead and unfeeling. The same and yet confused. Lamb and Wolf cocked their heads and turned their gaze back to the woman. I'm staking gold on the wolf's wager this year. Hopefully Lamb's luck win winks at me. She blew a kiss at the two of them, then flashed a gummy smile. Merry bloody kindred eve to you both. The, wondered, the woman waved farewell and sauntered off into the crowd, dragging her loincloth-clad wolf behind her. What a weak wolf. I feel sad and angry, like I want to hunt and not hunt. That is called confusion, dear wolf. It is an emotion mortals feel, perpetually and pervasively. I do not like this confusion. Wolf shook his head. Lamb reached out and rubbed the underside of his chin. To them, dear wolf, we bring the greatest confusion, she said. Confusion is a hunt, then? A game of knocking down and not getting back up? Not quite, but also, yes. Confusion dwells between the knocking down and then not getting back up. My claws itch, lamb. 
It's the festival ended now. For now, we keep our pledges, dear wolf. When does now end? Sooner than you know, but later than you'd hope. Wolf placed his chin on Lamb's lap and listened to the incessant flurry of thousands of beating hearts he could not chase. And then above it all, a strange sound caught his attention. What is that howling, little lamb? It is not howling, but music, dear Wolf. Wolf's eyes lit up. His great tongue lolled back out, drooling. Can I chase music? In a manner of speaking, yes. Four. The Wheeled Corsair. Lamb and Wolf followed a melodious patchwork to a stage where musicians dressed in black furs played mismatched but complimentary melodies. Oddly tuned horns warbled out wavering notes. Percussionists wailed on kettle drums and elongated logs. The music was both uplifting and haunting. The sound chases my ears! This music is called drag time, performed only on this night to honor tooth and arrow. Gunshouts rang out in perpetual succession. The sound of jeering, uh, jeering grew louder, spreading like mist across the bilgewater folk. A woman dressed like a corsair captain appeared at the prow of a prop sloop on wheels, pushed and pulled by strong-backed folks. Atop the ship sat a gilded cage with alabaster bars. More new things! My head is spun around! Wolf grabbled at the sight of the ship on wheels. That is curiosity, dear Wolf. A closed door ringed in light. What lies on the other side? Lamb leapt onto a, uh, uh, an awning above a butcher shop to get a better view. Wolf swirled around her. The crowd party, uh, parted as the ship grew nearer. The gilded cage loomed larger now. Its alabaster bars caught the glow of flickering street lamps. Inside, a figure cowered. Oi, make me uh, make way for the champion of the meek, the lover of the sick, yelled the captain. A weaning, muleless mess of weakling. The crier's words turned heads. Cheers arose as the revelers saw the pathetic figure inside the cage. A man who had been tarred and covered in cotton. His eyes were wide in fear and panic. He was the only Bilgewater local attending Kindred Eve against his will. I present to you the last honest man in our humble stretch of ports, the Lamb Fool of Bilgewater. The crowd welcomed the Lamb Fool by uh, barraging the lavish cage with whatever bric-a-brac lay within arm's reach. Heads of lettuce exploded on the bars. Overripe mango splattered stick pulp on his tarred and co uh, cotton skin. He looks like you, Wolf said to Lamb. Cruelty stuck her deviant thumb in the mortal mold. What a pitiful shape. Then was wrought. Countrymen! Countrymen! The landfall cried. I beg your mercy. I have not... I not... Have I not honored all my debts? Forgiven those who had not uh, sealed the serpent? I have committed no crime other than civility and compassion. He sounds like you. Cutting words, dear wolf. His words, nary have I spoke. The lamb fool shouted louder, Nary have I cheated, stolen, lied, or killed! His appeal to whatever conscious, uh, conscious the revelers had not drunk away proved uh, futile, as he was answered with rousing laughter and mocking imitation. Nary, nary, nary! On a boring little lamb, too. The, glow the glowing blue light of lamb's eyes looked downright frigid. The poor lamb fool was now gnawing at the bars with his teeth, pretending to be a wolf. Do you want me to be a bastard? Is that it? He cried, spitting on the crowd. The truest lambs find even the mask of a wolf paining, painfully unbecoming. Wolf laughed, too caught up in the bloodlust of the night. He turned lamb with joy in his eyes. I hope they do me next. I am sure you will not be disappointed, my dear wolf. Wolf then threw his head back and let loose a howl, 
a long and uh, lo so long and loud it silenced the night entirely. Terrible sound reverberated through flesh and bone, shaking everyone to their core. Five. The Howler, the Hungry, the Hunter. Once the howling faded, midnight told, the wolf moon reached zenith, signaling a shift in the mood, the direction of the revels, and perhaps more importantly, the winds. The procession left the town behind, the wheeled corsair leading the way. A somber, dirge-like mood took hold, in time with the odd rhythms of squeaking wagons, uh, wagon wheels, thousands of footsteps, and the whimpering of the lamb fool. The path had narrowed in its incline up toward the great leafless tree, which was lit by two large bonfires. The road ended here in a large open space. Beyond was only a cliff and a long fall to a grisly end in the rocks and churning waves. The two raging fires loomed larger in the darkness, blazing like the eyes of a leviathan rising from the sea. The leafless tree shook in the wind, rattling dead branches like dried bones. Jagged cliffs hewn and worn down by centuries of use formed the space into a rough amphitheater. I know this place, little lamb. Roots sprung from seedless fruits strangled the soil. Three figures emerged from behind the Eldlock tree, striking jarring and unnatural silhouettes against the flickering madness. Three giant wolf heads, decapitated below the neck, they wobbled forward, fire revealing truth. They were men in costumes. Their torsos were wrapped in thick fur, feet poked out from below the furry necks. The wolf heads, meticulously and terrifyingly constructed, towered above where shoulders should be. Each of the three figures' wolf-like headdresses was different. One howling with its snout pointed up toward the moon, another with its jaws open and a massive cloth tongue lolling out, and the last with its jaws clamped shut around the carcass of a freshly killed lamb. Too many false wolves. These are our masters of ceremonies, the howler, the hungry, and the hunter. The howler spoke first. We kindred souls do gather here under the dread wolf's moon, at the Eldlock's tree where death itself fledged company, next the hungry. Tonight we mock the day when the wolves conquer the lamb, and our liberties run rampant through all our land. Lastly, the hunter. Behold, the lamb fool, champion of all weakness, a thing of timid nature and erudite cowardice. We are truly honored by his presence. A thick metal ring was bolted into the outlock tree's wide trunk. A heavy chain snaked across the dirt where it was wrapped around lamb fool's scrawny neck. Upon his head sat a crown of snowy cotton and two little lamb's ears. He was truly a pathetic sight, bruised and hungry, wet and soiled from a night of hurled food and drink and other filth. The gathered audience laughed and booed. When the pathetic man raised his gaze, there was little light left in his eyes. He bowed his head into his hands, resigned to his fate. And now, said the howler, we present the champion of Bilgewater. Strongest of all, added the hungry, and ready to take what is hers by force and cunning. She salivates for the hunt, intoned the hunter. She smells blood. She smells death. She smells freedom. All hail the wolfkin warrior. The corsair captain stood proud on her wheeled sloop. She leapt off the prow of the false vessel and addressed the crowd. When death comes near, uh, comes for us, do we wish to greet it in our beds, ailing and frail, bodies wasted by disease? A body that can only pull the covers tighter over one's head? Who would die defeated and defanged? Not the wolf. Not I. Her voice rang with defiance. She pummeled her thighs with her fists. Her legs are strong. They will not die. My legs are strong. They will not die strong. Put my boots on and point me to the sea. Toward every shark, kraken, and jawfish. I'll die on the waters. I'll die with a sword in my gut. 
I'll die with a drink in my hand and a smile on my face. She, sh she stripped off her captain's attire. Underneath, she wore all black. Her limbs were thick as ship masts. A pair of tailored gloves with razor-sharp blades sewn into each finger gave her claws. The hunter placed a terrifying wolf mask over her face, teeth glistening white, completing the transformation. Wolf's eyes grew wide with excitement. He knew what was happening. There's the lamb, he said. They're playing us. We do not fight like this, dear wolf, and we shall not fight for a long time. Forever plus a day. Shh! Things are happening! Wolf's ears perked up, for he sensed a kill. The howler spoke again. The eternal struggle ends once more tonight, and one of these kindred two shall emerge victorious, and it will be in the final days when the wolf shall eat the lamb. The hungry spoke next. Should the lamb fool somehow claim victory? Laughter interrupted this suggestion. Then until the next kindred eve, we will restrain our basest instincts, turn an eye upward from the dregs, and clothe ourselves in manners and honor, uh, in manners and honesty. The hunter spoke last. If the wolfkin warrior emerges triumphant, we we, uh, we carry on our proud traditions in the name of ourselves and our desires. The crowd went wild. Flint locks were loosed. People threw teeth. Others decked each other in the face, screaming in a general, uh, adrenaline-fueled joy. The howler spoke once more. Dear revelers, friends, ladies, gentlemen, cutthroats, bandits, pirates, barbers, leviathan hunters, jawlers, captains, business folk, cheats, thieves, liars, gunslingers, sailors, soldiers, brigands, rogues, and all who call Bilgewater home, let us watch the wolf win on this one thousandth consecutive year and reign over all our doings. The wolf kin warrior, in addition to her claws, received a heavy cudgel ringed with shark teeth. It was a brutish weapon, created to cause the most vicious of deaths. Someone threw the lamb fool a bow with a broken string and a snapped arrow. He refused them, allowing them to clatter to the ground at his feet. He turned his eyes toward the moon. I can hear the waves, the lamb fool said. This will be over soon. No, <laughs> replied the wolfkin warrior with glee. I will make this last a very long while. Lamb studied the scene intently. The masked faces in the crowd leaning for forward, placing bets, exchanging money, vials of rare beast oils, ornate guns, and glowing gems. By what foolish hand does a rigged bout guide the, the fortune of one's ear? Dear wolf, they think us a game and try to tell us whom to hunt at least on this one day. They seek to direct our hand, knowing not whose hand they yank. What does all this folly accomplish? In the crowd, she saw the scantily dressed lamb from earlier and watched the young woman hand over a sack of gold from her loincloth clad friend. They want to hunt. They want to play. They do not like words or waiting. The crowd did not want to wait a uh, fair fight. They were not going to get one. Six, Wrath of the Lamb. The wolfkin warrior raised her club over the, her head. Her muscles rippled as she prepared to bring the cudgel down on, and bash in the lambful skull. Blood sport is fun! Wolf laughed, his eyes getting full. This is not blood sport, dear wolf. This is mockery. Let them learn the wrath of Lamb and the might of the meek. Lamb removed her mask. She turned away and hid her true face, even from Wolf. In the distance, there was a sound like rolling thunder. The wind kicked up harder now. A quiet clung to the air, but it did not diminish the fervor of the audience enraptured in a lust for blood. Few could see the golden trace of a strange music, of magic, old and not of the world. Only Wolf saw, and he turned his head sharply to Lamb. You said no playing. I said no chasing, and no water speak, dear wolf. The lamb f fool felt nothing, 
as the grizzly bludgeon smashed into his crown, the crown of his head, all the might of the wolfkin warrior behind its blow. His spirit, instead of ebbing out of his the cracks in his skull, arose in his core like a flame stoked uh, to life by a whipping air. The weakened lamb fool survived the we uh, killing blow, and then another, and another after that. Shine on, O oh defiant spirit who ignores the pains of body, who saw the moon for more than an ill omen and heard the waves upon above the impending crush. The last honest man in Bilgewater raised himself up on a shaky knee, then up to standing. The wolf can howled and circled the lamb fool. Wolf howled with her, for he was furious at lambs breaking the rules. He could not speak, only froth. Lamb placed an arrow on her bow and drew her deadly aim. I made no promise to set aside my arrows. She loosed her arrow, and it passed right through the wolfkin warrior's heart, tearing soul from body instantly. But the crowd did not see Lamb protect the lamb fool or fire her arrow at the wolfkin warrior. They saw a man survive devastating blows. The gathered clouds loosened a single bolt of fury. The lightning struck the wolfkin warrior without warning. She stood a moment as a conduit for forces far greater than her flesh and bones, and then only a scorched husk remained. Her smoking body toppled with a thud. The lambful was utterly befuddled. A godly act had spared him, but no applause erupted. Instead, there was silence. The, cloud was, the crowd was dumbstruck. A woman vomited on her shoes. Never before in one thousand years had the wolf perished before the lamb. Does this mean we have to honor our contracts this year? Asked a hook-handed reveler. The lamb won! I'm rich! The scantily clad lamb cheered. She began kissing the revelers around her. They were far too gobsmacked to react. Tears of disbelief welled up in their eyes. Wolf pressed his face into lambs, their masks almost touching. No fair! He howled with fury. So did others in the crowd. Thowls, thousands howled at the moon as one. Lamb pulled away from her wolf. She slung her bow on her back and shrugged. It must be that once in every long while, plus a day, that Lamb bests the wolf. Lamb cheated! Wolf growled. He turned and fixed his gaze on the now terrified Lamb fool. And if little Lamb wants to play... Lamb bowed, bow, bowed low to her wolf. Then it is only fair that her dearest wolf may play as well. The battered lamb fool looked around nervously, but there was no place to hide, unless he were to jump from the ledge and plummet to the rocks below. Wolf pounced upon the lamb fool, knocking him over the cliff and into the churning oceans. When wolf returned, he was licking his lips, still not sated. The howler, the hungry, and the hunter shuffled around the fallen wolfkin warrior. They conferred over her body, hoping for her to take another breath. But she was burnt and gone. The crowd turned, sorrow and anger boiling over the, at the thought of la a lamb fear a year filled with calm and peace. The howler raised his hands and commanded silence, which spread like wildfire. One could hear a feather fall. For a thousand years, we of Bilgewater have lived in the shadow of the Woolio, the great black wolf. None command him, and so none command us. The hungry stepped forward. Varya, the educated lamb of light, was afforded the tiniest place in our hearts and in our dealings. The hunter uh, took her turn. I'm here to announce that the wolfkin's heart still beats! The wolf warrior is the victor! A thousand years in the shadow of Wolio! The corsair was clearly dead, and the kindred too had seen she was uh, she was the first to fall. But the official proclamation caused an eruption of joyous applause from the revelers. All was right in the world. Wolf wins the game! Wolf laughed. Lamb cocked her head sideways. The truth is plain as night is dark. The avatar of dearest wolf expired first. We know this to be true. No matter. They say I win. This is their party. They make the rules. Those who set rules may indeed write rules to rewrite rules. 
Wolf sniffed at the air. The wind carried the stench of another hunt, one that would end before dawn's breaking. No one noticed a stray ember leaping from the bonfire to the dried branches of the leafless tree, or how it caught the bow uh, bows. None could tell floating embers from the stars in the night, the confusion surrounding the lamb fool's overturned victory. None saw the bonfires inch, uh, inching higher and higher. Does a parade end, little lamb? All things end, dear wolf. Now? Now. Seven. Ashes of anticipation. Dear wolf? Yes, little lamb. Of that capricious night's bouquet of flavor, what tastes and smells and sounds did wolf savor? The lamb fool's throat looked weak, but was filled with juice. Grapes unwilling to leave the vine, sometimes produce the finest wine. The three wolves, they were sweet first, but my tongue's turned over. How bittersweet their final moot, trampled a flame under many a boot. The music makers, they popped, they screamed, they crackled. Burning players playing burnt songs, melodies alight with night's wrongs. The pale liar, salt on my tongue, salt on my fur. A storyteller swallowed by water, cast overboard by those fleeing slaughter. There was another lamb. She liked us. Did she burn? The poor soul wagered a foolish debt, hung from the docks on an ill-advised bet. It was a good hunt, even if we had to wait. Indeed. Deed, dear wolf, anticipation heightens rewards. Little lamb, did you taste anything? Your lamb tastes only ashes, but for one flavor that flashes. That our prey never gleans our meaning. They cast us into roles most demeaning. We hunted, we chased, I knocked down so many. Can we hunt the festival again next year? They will fear us now. The view of all who survived that night now burnt stone. No cra greater kindred eve has Bilgewater ever known. I love you small.